I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class, um, often called leg reg or legislation and regulation. And we're going to be talking about the rule of lenity. This is a classic canon of construction um, that's really about construing penal statutes or the criminal code uh, in favor of defendants or giving defendants the benefit of the doubt when there's ambiguity in the statute. And by the way, um, you're going to see references throughout this to something called Sutherland's statutory construction. A couple uh, quick words about this. First, Sutherland's is the sort of premier uh, um, multi-volume treatise about statutory interpretation and construction. So when you're in practice, if you need uh, uh, the most authoritative secondary source you can find besides case law um, uh, to cite in a brief, you should use Sutherland's. It, it's uh, sort of like the highest word on statutory interpretation. The other thing that's nice is about Sutherland's is that it's um, a database on Westlaw and is searchable and is annotated. And so if you have a case come up that's about something like the rule of lenity, Sutherland's will, um, uh, annotated, will point you to a lot of other cases and save you a lot of time in finding other cases about this, um, at least older cases, uh, on different aspects and applications of the rule of lenity. Okay, last word about this. The rule of lenity is part of a group of things we call canons of construction. And we're not talking about construction like putting up buildings, we're talking about construction in the sense of construing a statute um, and when judges have to interpret a statute. The case book that I use divides these sort of classic canons of construction into semantic canons, which are really about how words relate to each other in a sentence and uh, um, or in a body of text. Some of them feel like grammatical rules almost. And, um, and then substantive canons, which are really sort of policy decisions from the courts about that really reflect an understanding of the judiciary's role vis-a-vis um, -vis the legislature and the executive branch and, and so forth. And in some ways, some people wouldn't even call them canons, um, substantive canons. They would just say it's just a maxim or a rule. You should also be aware, and I say this to my students many times, there's a long tradition starting in uh, with a very influential long law review article um, in 1950 that is of academic skepticism about the canons of construction and, and people saying that they're all a hoax or meaningless or things like that. Um, I hold the contrary view, which is that statutes are their own sort of genre of writing, written text or literature that has um, distinct structural features and compositional features. And a lot of our canons are really just ways to recognize that or ways to identify these sort of um, building blocks of statutes that happen again and again and what we do with those. So this is a very sort of structural idea or a way of thinking that there's sort of this um, archetype template <clears throat> for statutes and the canons are in, almost help uh, name these different like building blocks that we have that we combine and recombine when we draft and enact statutes. Okay, so let's talk just about the rule of lenity for a moment. Um, here's a, I'm going to have a few quotes from uh, Sutherland about it, and then some of my own comments for you. Traditionally, courts have construed penal statutes, and again, we're talking about criminal statutes where you can go to jail, um, strictly in a defendant's favor. Uh, two centuries ago, the Supreme Court, John Marshall, observed the rule that penal laws are to be construed strictly is perhaps not much less old than construction itself. In other words, this is one of our oldest canons. Um, it has a very impressive historical pedigree uh, going back to um, the 16 um, and 1700s. So commentators have noted that the rule's rise is rooted in a series of 16th, 17th, and 18th century English statutes that excluded many criminal defendants from the benefit of the clergy, which was a longstanding practice to mitigate the law's severity by abrogating the death penalty for common law felonies. And so uh, this is a mouthful, but it's a way of saying, remember at common law, we had the death penalty for 
kind of available for every felony, even theft. Today, we only use the death penalty for murder, but in the common law period, any felony could carry the pen, could carry the death penalty. And because of the severity of the punishment, courts and, to be honest, juries um, found ways over the years to sort of work a few drops of mercy um, into this and to sort of avoid um, giving people the death penalty in some cases. If you think about it, when the stakes are that high, maybe courts are more likely to really think about what they're doing and, be, and that affects how they interpret things. <clears throat> um, also keep in mind though, that in that same period um, in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, we really didn't have as many statutes to interpret. So parliament really didn't legislate as much as modern Congress does. And so the courts, a lot of times in the common law era, were in fact dealing with common law, the judge-made law, more than statutes by comparison with today's courts where every we live in an age of statutory law and everything is driven by statutes and interpreting statutes. Here's another quote. The rule of strict construction or rule of lenity in the criminal context requires courts to interpret ambiguous penal laws in favor of the defendants subjected to them. If you wanted a nice classic like statement of the rule of lenity, that's one from a pretty official source. Now, here's a few sort of nuances or caveats. The rule of, len of lenity applies only if after using the usual tools of statutory construction, courts are left with a grievous ambiguity or uncertainty in a statute. In other words, if the statute's clear, there's no rule of lenity to come into play. It doesn't trigger the rule of lenity. The rule of lenity is about ambiguous criminal statutes, or maybe, maybe, where a statute is silent on some point that has come up in, in a criminal prosecution. And the idea is when there's statutory silence or ambiguity or vagueness that we should resolve that in the favor, lean a little bit in the defendant's favor, sort of tilt the table, um, so to speak. But remember, if the statute's really clear, it doesn't matter um, uh, the rule of lenity doesn't matter at all and doesn't come into play. Okay, uh, here's another quote. If a law, and I have the sites uh, there in fine print, if you need to jot it down, you can pause the video. If a law has both criminal and civil applications, the rule of lenity governs its interpretation in both settings. And the more severe an act's possible penalty, the stricter the construction may be. In other words, if we're going to interpret the statute more narrowly, the more severe the punishment is. And so courts often construe a felony statute more strictly than a misdemeanor statute. Okay, we're not going to go too much longer, I promise. The rule of lenity applies to the substantive ambit of criminal prohibitions, as well as those, the, to the penalties they impose, including sentencing guidelines. And this is an interesting point that we don't often cover in our statutory interpretation classes and cases, is that we also, remember, have codified like sentencing guidelines now. And so we have to, judges end up having to interpret the sentence sections and, or punishment sections of either statutes or sentencing guidelines and the rule of lenity can come into play there as well. And in practical terms, when it applies, defendants are less likely to be guilty or liable and courts are, um, uh, will choose the less severe penalty even if the conviction is sort of in the bag. For example, remember that in the vast majority of criminal prosecutions in the United States, the defendants enter a guilty plea, right? We resolve the cases through plea bargaining in the probably more than 90% of the cases. So an awful lot of what judges are doing in on the criminal docket is really sentencing. Application of the rule depends as an initial matter on a judicial finding of ambiguity. And this is sort of um, extending a point from above. A statute is ambiguous if it can reasonably be interpreted in two or more ways, but it's not ambiguous simply because different interpretations are conceivable. A statute is not ambiguous for lenity purposes um, just because judicial authority is divided over its proper construction. And 
ambiguity is not equivalent to the mere possibility of a narrower reading. In other words, there's, we have a little bit of a problem that ambiguity is in the eye of the beholder. They're not saying that just because someone who's very, very imaginative could come up with a far-fetched alternative interpretation of a statute, and so now we get to invoke the rule of lenity, there really has to be two plausible readings or more of a statute or term. And the rule comes into operation, uh, this is actually a point that gets reiterated by Sutherland uh, several times. Um, it comes into operation at the end of the process of construing what a legislation, legislature has expressed, not at the beginning as an overriding consideration of being lenient to wrongdoers. So the word itself, lenity, is basically a cognate of our word lenient. It means leniency. It's just an archaic word for that. Um, but we're not just announcing at the outset that we're going to interpret the statute um, as leniently as we can. We already sort of have a burden of proof that's supposed to do that work, right? The prosecutors have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and so forth. And then we have a number of procedural protections um, like the warrant requirement and so forth to protect people against um, uh, uh, bogus prosecutions. And so the rule of lenity doesn't come into play before trial. And think of it that way. When you're in practice, if you are doing criminal work, this is not a, a part of the pre-trial um, motions uh, 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 process like exclusionary rules and motions in limine and things like that. This is going to come in um, it really often at the, um, at when you're talking about the jury instructions, for example. So uh, courts treat the rule as a tiebreaker when there's an otherwise unresolved ambiguity in the statute. And I actually really like that little phrase. And so think of the rule of lenity as the tiebreaker in favor, but always in favor of the defendant when there's some otherwise unresolved statutory ambiguity. Okay, a couple of things for you on test questions, and you should also watch out for this. In theory, the rule of lenity could pop up on the bar exam even. The rule of lenity applies only in criminal cases, never in a strictly civil case. So we're not gonna talk about the rule of lenity in torts or contracts or property law. And so watch out for this. This is a gotcha test question to give you some sort of hypothetical about a civil lawsuit and then give you the rule of lenity, ask you if the rule of lenity applies. And it, that's a trick question. It only applies if we have a criminal prosecution. Also note, and this is sort of kicking things up a notch here, in many cases, the rule of lenity is in tension with the last antecedent rule, like in United States v. Bass, um, because the latter makes the statute broader. In, in other words, the last antecedent rule says that a final modifier refers only to one word or phrase, which makes it easier for the prosecution to win. And the rule of, so what you're going to see when you read criminal cases, especially if it goes to a Supreme Court, is that uh, when you have a majority and a dissent, a lot of times one, one group of the justices is talking about the rule of lenity and the other view, like if it's a majority is talking about the rule of lenity, a lot of times the dissent will be talking about the last antecedent rule um, and vice versa. So you could have the majority going with the last antecedent rule and then the dissent saying we should have followed the rule of lenity here. Okay, um, where do we get this rule of lenity? Courts often base it on ideas of due process. The idea that unclear statutes are also unfair to the citizenry. And, and so for example, someone doesn't, who wants to obey the law doesn't really know how to conform their behavior to the requirements of the law. Um, and all of a sudden they're being prosecuted and caught by surprise. And that idea is supposed kind of horrifying to the judiciary. Uh, keep in mind that ignorance of the law is no excuse, but the idea is we don't really want to have these open-ended vague um, rules that are then construed against criminal defendants. You could in that sense, you could think of this as a step down from holding the statute void for vagueness. If it's not so vague that we have to invalidate the statute on constitutional grounds, and by the way, void for vagueness is always done on due process grounds, um, then maybe we can construe the ambiguity, we'll save the statute, but 
construe it a little bit in the direction of favoring the defendant. Others may treat this as sort of leveling the playing field a little bit between the fearsome power of the executive branch of the government. Remember that the prosecutors are sort of the sharp end of the stick um, for our democratic government. And then you have these sort of helpless individual defendants. And if you have a judge that sees a lot of cases as these sort of David versus Goliath battles between the lone individual citizen um, and the, the scary big um, government with almost infinite resources, they may talk about the rule of lenity as sort of trying to help the little guy, so to speak, or intervene where um, it's not a level playing field or a fair fight at all. Okay, that concludes our sort of quick overview of the rule of lenity.